Welcome back to the Toppy Blues, your source for all things Everton. I'm Connor Williams, joined by Ed. Uh, and today we're going to be doing the uh, post-match extra time from the Everton Crystal Palace game that finished 3-0 uh, at Goodison Park. Um, yeah, give me your thoughts on this, first of all, Ed. Yeah, just nice to not have to stress um, for the final whistle for the first time in what feels like, God, ages. Um, just, yeah, good game, great game. Probably our best, obviously our best one this season um, in terms of against an opponent who's pretty decent and, you know, definitely a worry in terms of our position. But I, I can't really say much else. Just an all-round really good performance. And it was just nice, not just to like sort of look down at the watch and just be like, oh, that's how long's left. Nice. Not having to go, ah, where's this final whistle coming? Yeah, yeah, I completely agree, mate. There's something about Crystal Palace at, at Goodison Park as well lately that just just fits nicely. Um, obviously, the game before that, uh, to put in comparison, was the sort of Newcastle game. Uh, talk to me about like how these are two such polar opposite games when you watched us against Newcastle. I think it was one shot overall, never mind on target. And then for this game where we created a lot of chances. Yeah, strange one, considering the fact it's basically the same team as well. Um, I actually think the biggest difference of all, um, and I'm pretty sure we'll obviously talk about him a bit later on when he with his goal, but I thought with Calvert-Lewin being fully fit and fully, like, game fit, not just fitness fit, match fit ready. Um, and I put out a tweet earlier after the game as well. You could you could understand why uh, he was such a big plan in terms of uh, for what Lampard wanted to do with the team and when, you know, you hear about these meetings that they had when he was going for the job interviews and whatever, how much of a like, influence he wanted Calvert-Lewin to be because he was just everywhere. And he's like, he started... The pressures he started the intensity um and it was very clear how much of an attack was going to be based off him whether he was going to be the wall to throw the ball at to then rebound or whether it was going to be putting it through to him so that he could finish it off or whether it was relying on him just his presence to be able to distract defenders so that we could have more time with the ball i don't know but um i personally thought it was his best game ever in, in an Everton shirt, both on and off the ball. It's absolutely incredible. And I think, really, that's what the difference was. Because if you look at the first and the second goal, he was, obviously, in the first goal, he was involved because he scored. But he started it straight away from putting pressure on the midfielder and then he was getting the ball. And then in the second goal, he was involved in the build-up as well, um, bringing out some of the defenders and obviously moving them out of their, out of their defensive line. And, you know, and I, I think it was... he should have a lot more credit than he is getting um, in terms of, I'd argue, his, his best game in terms of as a number nine for us. Yeah, um, Calvert-Lewin's an interesting one again. Um, I, I, I was going to wait, but we might as well get into it now before we even go through the goals because it's on the discussion. Um, again, another player that had a bit of a Jekyll and Hyde performance from Newcastle, which I think was one of his worst games I've ever seen him play in an Everton top. Um, nearly, nearly got sent off was very lucky, I think, at times not to be. So then, like you said, a really, really great game. Um, I've got to put his Newcastle performance down to fitness, just coming back from injury, hasn't played in a while. I'm going to say that because he looked a bit sluggish as well. Um, but like you mentioned, he, he performed really well in this game. I uh, saw a couple of people afterwards tweeting, you know, wrapping him in cotton wool. Um, and I do you think he gets the... Um, credit he deserves from the fan bases in a general because when he was out and when we've looked at comments on the channel um and I remember I called him more I said he was more prolific than Moy Pie and people were you know sort of digging at it. Do you think he gets a bit he's a bit hard done by at times because his injuries the last year or so have been a bit of an annoyance for fans, which by the way he can't help either put as a disclaimer. I mean, I think I think with his with his injuries, it's all sort of started with one, and then because of the desperate situation we were in last season, we rushed him back too early then, and then 
again with this season it's it's been a case of we didn't have a striker at first we tried to play him um and then it's just been an unfortunate injury i mean i'm hoping you know touch wood i'll slam my fist on my desk that he, he stays fit for the whole season now because it's it's clear how much of an effect he does have on the team and i i i've pretty much been a backer of him since sort of day dot when he made his, I think it was one of his first games was against Hull City. Um, And I've always thought he's had the potential and I've always thought he looked like a a guy who could replace Lukaku. And, you know, he showed that in terms of in like the Ancelotti season behind closed doors. He was a really prolific goal scorer. All right. Yeah. Tapping merchant, whatever. But, you know, you've still got to be a decent enough striker to be able to read situations and, follow the ball at the right amount of time. I mean, look at Erling Haaland. He's basically a tapping merchant, and I'm not saying they're anywhere near in terms of levels of ability, but he he is a proper number nine. He is a num- number nine that likes to get physical, likes to win the ball, likes to score the goals. I mean, yeah, he might not dribble past 20 or 30 players and score an amazing solo goal, but he can be there at the right time. If he's match fit, he'll read the situation and read the ball and he, he does have a decent shot on him. He doesn't get like involved enough to be able to have that like shot on target or whatever, but he's he's a good, solid striker. And I think the calls to sell him last season, I could understand, because obviously like his injury record and whatever, but I, I I don't understand the criticism he does get because, like you've said, the injury record and that, it's not on him. He wants to come back and he wants to play. Because any young footballer would. But unfortunately, our management at times last season let him down in getting him to play too early, too too much before a recovery that really should have been going on. And then, you know, he's knackered himself. But hopefully now this is the start again for him. Yeah, and it, it, it's worth pointing out as well, he's still like, you know, relatively young into his career. He's improved massively. That Angelotti season proved that he wasn't just a lad before that. He was a lad that worked hard, ran hard. Then he's, like, like you said, people called him a tapping merchant, which Miroslav Closer never scored from outside the box and made an absolute career off it. He's, he's Strikers are meant to get goals. It's their job description. Um, and you saw shades of that as well for this goal. We'll go through his um, goal now, um, as it was one of the first ones. But you could see sort of shades of that Angelotti um, sort of level of Calvert-Lewin where he takes his shot well before then people are just I think people see him more as a header of the ball which he's he is very good at but um his his ability to finish one-on-ones is very good like you said he's not a dribbler but talk me through this goal and sort of the shades you could see from Angelotti I mean you look at it straight away he's he's used his physicality which you know at six foot three he should be um and and like putting pressure on you midfielder straight away um, to to win the ball back, which set up the intensity straight away. Nice little bit of pressure as well with Anana and um, and Awobi as well. So sets up nicely there, gets the ball back off Awobi. And I don't think it took a it didn't take a touch off the defender, did it? When he oh. when he like knocks it around him, so he's then just used his strength and a little bit of skill to get around the defender and. Maybe a bit of a stronger shot could have been necessary, but it still went in the back of the net, regardless of if it take a touch off the keeper or not. And yeah, you, you just can't really say much more. It's just a nicely worked goal that is just any striker would be happy with, realistically. Any striker would be happy to get that. And especially, I think it also has, has set the tone in terms of, yeah, this guy's this guy's back. He's he's match fit now. He's ready. He's wanting to play, and especially with Southgate watching, may whether he knew at the time, I don't know. But if he knew Southgate was watching, that might have sort of made him think, yeah, I need to put on a pretty good performance as well today if I even want to be considered for the World Cup squad coming up. Yeah, I, I think I think probably um, it had been somewhat no maybe known to him but he did he performed miles better and like you said it was a pretty much a perfect game for him um it was a really good game another player that i think sort of start the season hot 
last couple of games, uh, I think it's fair to say struggled. Uh, but amongst the goals again, or albeit this one truly was a tap in. Um, Anthony Gordon talked me through his his goal and sort of your thoughts on Anthony Gordon so far this season. Uh, I think he blows a little bit of hot and cold sometimes, personally. Yeah, I mean, I had, I was on the, um, I was on the record for the Newcastle game or one of them, um, and one of the talking points was Anthony Gordon. And I remember it in the pre-recording notes was, um, yes, we are going to talk about Gordon again because he's been incredibly annoying. And I think with this game, it was, I wasn't a sort of, I saw him in the lineup and I thought, why is he back in? Because he doesn't deserve to be in it. He really didn't deserve to have another chance given to him. Um, and I'm very happy to eat humble pie with it because I think from the first minute, one of the, uh, I think he put in a tackle, it was in like within the first couple of minutes of the game and one of the defenders gets the ball back and I think the ball then went out of play, but it instantly you recognise, okay, I think he's starting to learn, you know, to take some, take the ego down, take the criticism and that down um, a bit. And he he had a really, really good game. I can't fault him. I, but it reminded me a lot more of the Gordon of last season, who had the effort and attention to what he was doing, what his game plan was. So good on him. And all right, yeah, tap in. But again, you've just got to be there at the right place in the right time and be able to read where the ball's going to go, just in case. And with the second goal, fabulous uh, in terms of play. I, I, I've got nothing nothing but praise for it. And I only wish uh, Garner Gay had a, had a touch on it because then every single player would have had a touch of the ball um, going in for that second one. But... I think it also shows straight away what kind of football I think Lampard wants to go to. Like that's sort of going to be the next level up in a way. Like we can have flashes of it now and then, but if we start going on a bit like that too much, we'll get predictable. And we we don't really have the players to be able to do that week in, week out. And it work at the same intensity and the same level. But it was nice to see sort of a preview almost. And I wished that Mikalenko had scored it because I think he deserved it because he had a really good game as well. But no, strong enough shot to get a, a rebound and then a nice tap in from, from Gordon, which somehow I I really don't understand either how the linesman flagged it for offside, considering the angle that you see him at is 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 crazy. But I don't know what your thoughts are on it with that. Yeah, it was it was like the time I was like he's he's it was pretty obvious he wasn't, but then I think once they start showing the replay and getting the lions out on the telly for you at home and stuff, when you watch it back, it's it makes it even worse of a call uh, when you slow it down and you look back because he's just he's nowhere near. Uh, but it wouldn't be Everton would it without one dodgy officiating uh, decision going somewhere. So um, the obviously Gordon, like we said, talked we talked about how um, he blew hot and cold. Um, one of the, the the other players is uh Damari Gray, um, and both of them might be a little bit worried because the third goal came from Dwight McNeil, um, and it started it well as well. Talk me through Dwight McNeil's goal because this was really nice to watch. Yeah, I mean, I I'm I'm thrilled for him for one because he seems like just a, he seems like a nice like humbled lad that wants to do well for the club as well, and I. I... I'm I'm in the camp of he should be starting every game because I feel that he's he'll get a goal, he'll get an assist, and the ball is going to start rolling for him because I think he's for a little bit of time for the few games he did play before, um, before the Southampton game, he always looked like he had the defensive capability in terms of putting the pressure on the players and you know trying to win the ball back for the team and he was just missing some goals and assists and. He's come from a system, I think I said it in the last recording, but he's come from a system which he doesn't really, he would never really play for any other team apart from Burnley, you know, with crossing it into a big, big guy up front. Uh, yeah, I mean, the third goal was like just a thing of beauty. And I've been in the camp for a while of Dwight McNeil needing to start a few games because every game sort of before the Southampton one, he was missing goals and assists, but his defensive pressures, winning the ball back for the team, was was top notch, and I don't think 
I don't think that was getting appreciated enough. And I was surprised with the Southampton game that he got dropped the game after. I think it was the Man United one for Gordon. Um, so I do think if he's going to get a run of games, he'll his goals and assists will start to come up. And especially with Calvert-Lewin in, um, that's going to help him a lot in terms of for a target to cross to or whether, a, like I said, a wall to get the rebound of the shot off. Um, but I do also think the goal he scored was... And like a showcase of his ability in terms of because he dribbled past was it three players something like that in the Palace game yeah. something like that um, a nice little like layoff to Wobi which I actually thought that Wobi was going to have a shot at but then a, a lovely lovely back heel pass for him to finish into an empty net and you know he still had the composure to do that and I'm hoping now he'll get a start at the Fulham game because that could be another one in terms of his ability to improve again and maybe have a bigger effect on the team. So I personally would be worrying if I was Damari Gray, because I think he could be taking his place. Yeah. And and the fact that um, he's probably, this is the only reason I mentioned Damari Gray, maybe worrying and Anthony, not Anthony Gordon, because he can get the goals, but it's the fact that um, I don't think our crossing has been particularly great from the wingers this season. Uh, bearing in mind, Calvert-Lewin's now back in the fold. And that's sort of the they're the balls he sort of prays for. Dwight McNeil, I think it's fair to say, he's probably our most accomplished winger in terms of crossing. Like did it at Burnley, knows how to do it. Um, I think it's a match made in heaven that we're yet to that we're yet to see fully. Um speaking of uh Damari Gray, what, yeah, like you said, it might be time to drop him. Um I think he's more of a goal scoring winger, but even then he I think he struggled, hasn't he, as of late. Mm. He is an interesting one because I do also think he's got uh, bags of ability as well. But again, it is one of those that you don't know who you're gonna get on the day because um, he does have the he does have the threat against defenses, and maybe it's a case of um, you take him off for a bit, bring him on a, off the bench, and he'll be able to change the game in a way. Um, you know, it's. Yeah, he's a tough one. He really is a tough one because there's games where it's like he's done amazing and you think, yeah, snip of a purchase that we made for one and a half million to sign him. And then it's other times where it's like, oh, you can understand why Leverkusen let him go for that little. Um, so, uh, again, I mean, how old is he? Like 26 or something? Is he entered his prime yet? Something like that. Is he? I forget how, young, how old he is because he's been around for quite a while now. Hmm. So yeah. it, I I don't know I don't know on him at the moment I do think though he's a very good in terms of at least backup option I think the three wingers we've got I've I've said it before uh, Dwight McNeil Anthony Gordon Damari Gray all very good options in terms of off the bench should we need it because I think all three of them as well offer something slightly different in terms of like crossing ability, finishing ability, dribbling ability, they've all got like sort of their own little characteristic which can help to either change the team or help win a game. So, you know, it, it's not really... I don't think there's sort of the need to be stressed in terms of the, our wingers, in terms of replacements. Um, as of yet, we're, we're good, I would say, with that. It's just a case of we need to find out what their best abilities are, how, how best to utilise it as well. And especially with Cavalier and being back, maybe this will help them. everything. Well, all three of them, really. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. I, I think they all do, like you said, offer something a little bit different. Damari Gray, I think, out of all three wingers, um, possesses pace as well, which is uh, very important in the modern game. And like you said, maybe bringing him on when players are a bit more, the opposition's a bit more tired, um, uses blistering pace to catch out defenders, uh, might be one of the key ways going forward. Um, it'd be absolutely criminal to not speak about Alex Awobi. We've mentioned him briefly, but um, as the man's got two assists and is on one of the biggest renaissances of somebody's career I've ever seen, uh, it'd be an absolute crime, wouldn't it, to not speak about Awobi? Do you know what? It's the biggest thing, though, is that he's set the standards himself for this season that he doesn't get talked about first, even though he's got two assists. That's, that's the biggest sort of uh, praise you can give him. It's like, now he's set his standards for himself that he doesn't get talked about. He won't get talked about enough because 
he's now put putting it through game in, game out. Every week he's doing at least a 7 out of 10. And when it's maybe not going well for him, I mean, like the Newcastle game, for example, it wasn't his best game, but it definitely wasn't the worst player on the pitch by any means. Um, so I do, I, I, I'm, I'm made up for him and I'm made up that I've got to eat humble pie with him because I was one of his biggest critics at the start of last season. Um, and the way he's just turned it around is absolutely amazing. And he, I think after Pickford is pretty much the first name on the team sheet now for every single game. And I was also surprised that he's now only second in the list behind De Bruyne in terms of assists, which now it's it's one of those that he's now getting sort of talked about in the media because he's only second behind De Bruyne. But it, who knows? Who knows where, how many assists he could get this season, depending on how fit Calvert-Lewin stays, how fit the front line stay. I I just couldn't be happier for him. And he's he's not even an old lad either. He's only, what, 27? Something like that, yeah. maybe? Yeah. At the most? But... Yeah. It, it's amazing, isn't it? Um, I was going to say, if you told us, like, two years ago, even last year, we'd have laughed if we'd said, oh, you'll be talking yeah. about a Wobi week in, week out. And it'd be a positive light, because I do feel like we spoke about him quite a bit in his, um, when it wasn't going to plan, but... It's just an amazing thing to see. And I think you can see he enjoys his football as well, uh, which might be a massive one. Um, when you look at how he plays, he seems to enjoy himself a lot more. Um, seems like a great character to have in the locker room. His Snapchat yeah. is always brilliant content. Um, he's, he's he's a character. Uh, so it, it, it's good to see. Um, and like you said, he's he's a lad that had it rough. I, I gave it him rough as well. Uh, a couple of Arsenal fans that I knew were laughing when we bought him. Um, absolutely laughing and I've been laughing ever since up until now where they're not quite laughing anymore because he seems to be yeah. doing good yeah uh, I, I, there, there isn't really much else to say that hasn't been said on Alex Iwobi just I, I really do hope it, it works out for him there and he can have a few more assists maybe turn out a bit like his uh, his uncle wasn't too bad of a player either. So, you know, maybe, you never know. We might have the next year. Joe Koch, it would be quite nice. Yeah, who knows? Who knows? I, there's always bits where I forget that his uncle's JJ Koch. It's like um, Jordan and Andre Ayew. I forget their dads are Betty Pele uh, in moments. Oh, really? Well. I yeah, know yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely blew my mind. But then when you when you think about it and then you see them all, they do have the father some resemblance between the yeah. three of them. So it's only once you mention it. But um, yeah, uh, I think that's all we've got as well for the um, Crystal Palace game, other than just to top it off with just a brilliant result that was needed. Um, Ed, I think it was, I was going to say, uh, it's, it's Seamus Coleman's annual brilliant performance against Crystal Palace. Seems to have Zaha's number every time they play each other. And Zaha was rattled as well. The the father oh. Gordon, he was, I think his head had gone. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, it only means that we're de- we're definitely going to get a Seamus Coleman stinker in one of the next few games. Unfortunately, oh, don't be like that. <laughs> just just because I I do I do think um, as much as I love him, I do think we need we probably shouldn't be having thirty six year old Seamus Coleman running down the line as much anymore. But um, we'll try and stay positive and end it on enjoy it while it lasts. Um, yeah, Ed, next game. Yeah, yeah, Fulham uh, beatable. Beatable, do you dare say it? Or if we play like we did against Palace, then yeah. Yeah. If we play like we did against Newcastle, then no, definitely not. Should be interesting as well, Marco Silva. Uh, mm. Yeah. I imagine he really wants to get one over on us. So it's gonna be tough. Um but yeah, like I said, I think that's all for the Crystal Palace game. Ed, thank you for joining me, mate. It's been a pleasure. No worries. Um also final note, screw that referee because he was Awful, absolutely awful. Biggest one, biggest criticism I've got is that the two drop kit and drop ball situations. He gives one to Palace, even though it was our ball, and then he, it goes down the other end, and he runs all the way across the pitch to then give the ball back to Palace again. Every fan in the stadium just going, "What is this guy doing?" But yeah, awful, woeful. I hope we don't have him again because. My God, there was some stuff in that game I didn't understand. It's the state of referees in the Premier League, I believe. (laughs) (laughs) 
But don't forget, guys, to like the video, subscribe to the channel if you're not already, and comment down below your thoughts on the game. And we'll see you very, very soon.